Welcome to Thinking Tackle. I'm Adam Penning and there can be very few of you watching this who haven't heard of linear fisheries and probably even fewer of you still who have at some point not visited here. And that's because it's one of the busiest and most accomplished day ticket waters in the country, if not in Europe. Why? Because it offers very, very big carp on a day ticket. 30, 40 pound carp that normally you would have to join expensive syndicates to fish for. They're available here for all to go at and there's other lakes on the complex that take, really cater for all styles of fishing. You've got runs waters, you've got 30s, you've got 40s, really everything to go at. So I'm down here with Daryl Peck. In my opinion, he's one of the very, very best big carp anglers around at the moment. He's caught two tone at 65 pounds and a whole host of other big, difficult 40 pound carp. Daryl's a big fish angler by nature and fishing this kind of water isn't really his forte. So I'm going to be fascinated to see how he approaches it and goes about trying to get a bite or two. Personally, I cut my teeth on venues like this. When Linear Fisheries first opened, I was down here learning how to cope with being hemmed in by other anglers and learning how to compete with other anglers, which is one of the things you've got to do if you're going to catch fish from these kind of lakes. OK, we're going to crack on, head off to my location now, and I'll show you how I'm fishing it. When we arrived, there were fish showing out in this bay in front of us. It was quite an easy decision to come in here. Daryl and I have got a couple of swims adjacent, so it's nice and social. To two totally different approaches and two totally different bits of water. What I've got in front of me here is lots of humps, lots of bumps. There's a gravel bar running out there. There's a nice reedy corner there that the wind's hacking into. And there's all sorts of things going on. But what I've done is the opposite to Daryl. I'm fishing it not focused on the features and we'll look at exactly why I'm doing that and what I'm doing with it later on. I've got about eight foot water out in front of me, maybe nine foot, a lot of Canadian pondweed which I, I guess is growing about two foot high off the bottom. I know that because I've wound some in, the white roots, you stretch it out and you can see that you've got about that to that of weed. So that lets you think about what you're fishing over and how you may need to adjust your rigs accordingly which again I'll cover later on. So that's my swim, I've got three rods out there spread over a bit of bait, not had a bite yet. One single bite came last night to Daryl. We're going to go now and look at his location and how he came about getting that bite. Daryl Peck. How you doing, mate? You right, mate? How you doing? Yeah, good, thank you. It's a bit windswept, isn't it? Yeah, serious. Blowing a bit of a hoolie. Well, we just had a little look at where I'm fishing and, and the swim that I'm in, and I just want to come down and get a feel for what you're doing, and uh, not so much what you're doing, because we're going to get that to, to that later, but what, what's, what you're doing in this swim. Why have you come and set up here? Well, basically, we're sandwiched between two banks of out-of-bounds, so we've got quite a bit of water between us, haven't we? So, uh, obviously, that gives us a, lot, a little bit to work with, and hopefully we won't get interfered with by other anglers, and that can be a common thing on day ticket waters. Tactical advantage, yeah. Tactical advantage. Um, in this swim in particular, you've got a couple of raised gravel areas out there. You can see now with the sun out, uh, it's like two gravel humps, and uh, I'm just inside them on the bottom of the shelf, because with the wind like this, it's quite cool. Yeah. And uh, we're just hope well, I'm hoping that the fish are going to be at the bottom of the shelf rather than in two, three foot of water where the swans can get me. I've, I've put my plan sack at the bottom of the, the gravel slope, kept my lines down, and it, yeah, it all looks all right. So what sort of depth of water are you in, mate? Uh, eight foot. Right, OK. And what do you reckon's on top? I guess you plumbed it. What's on top of those humps Yeah, sort of two or three foot. Right, OK. So let's imagine the weather changed and it went hot, high pressure. Would you change your tactics for that? Yeah, if I could see them in the upper layers, you know, the black shapes moving around just below the surface and they were getting knit around those humps, I wouldn't hesitate to put one bang on top, you know, bottom bait so the, the birds didn't interfere with me too much. Right. Just, yeah, go with, go with that. OK, excellent. Now, this is, as you, I mean, you know, this is one of the busiest, most heavily pressured day ticket waters in the country. Have you got a lot of experience coming on lakes like this? Not really. I've generally fished club waters, but the carp's a carp, you know, you've got to... Uh, You've got to see it that way. Club waters can be, be busy though, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly the same. So you, you've got a bit of experience in, in dealing with um, fishing against other anglers, because that's yeah. what a lot of this kind of fishing is about not only catching the carp, but it's about positioning yourself where you've got an advantage. Yeah. And, and trying to do things maybe that other people aren't. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to look a bit how, at what you're doing to get around that and maybe how you're getting into bites. Now, talking of bites, you did have one yesterday evening just after we set up, didn't you? Yeah, I got in the swim, uh, had a plumb round by those humps, found a spot. Put a whole bucket of spot gear in. Bold. Is that you'd obviously seen fish. That was yeah. So we've seen blind. fish in the area, right? And we've got three days, so I'm thinking I'll get a load of bait in, um, and hopefully it will materialise over the first couple of days. And if it doesn't, then we can uh, we can get on our toes and try and nick a bite at the end. But I thought I'd get the bait in early because I haven't got to do it later on in the session. 
And yeah, it went off straight away with it now. Right. You know, incredible. <laughs> you think all those seeds and little particles out of the bottom and you get a take that quickly. Yeah. You know, it's incredible. They're probably eating it out of the bottom of the spot. Well, that's, that's an interesting thing you say that, and on a lot of these um, busy waters, they, they recognise the sound of the spot as, as yeah. free food. And like you say, very often they'll come up in the layers. But a really important thing there that, that you've done, which the viewers can take for their own fishing, is that you put your rigs out and then you started spotting. Yeah, yeah. So all the time that bait's falling through the water. I mean, a lot of people, they'll spot all day and then cast at the end of it, wouldn't they? Yeah. So not only have you got the advantage of a, if any fish are following that spot mixed down, you've got a chance of a bite. Yeah. But also, I suppose you're covering your rigs, aren't you? Yeah, definitely, yeah. I can see from the state of your rods, mate, you've been spotting out a soupy old mix. That was a mucky job, I should think, wasn't it? Yeah, it took some time, didn't it? Look at the state of them. <laughs> right, OK, well, that's our locations both sorted. We're going to look at what Daryl's been doing with his bait, how he's got his rods in such a state, coming up next. OK, what we want to show you guys now is the different styles of fishing that Daryl and I are employing. And to make it easy for you to understand exactly what's going on, we've moved it out of the lake and we're going to show you on dry land the sort of baiting situation that we're using. So, Daryl, you're going up first, so you're using a spod. Yep. Uh, big mix of stuff there. Yep. What, what are you doing? What are your spod techniques? What's the key things for the viewer? Uh, key things is um, you need a shock lead for your spod rod. Automatically, you don't want to be cracking off all the time. So a strong 50 pound leader yep. and a rod that's up to the job, you know, something four or five pound test curve. Okay. Um, the main thing with spodding, it's got to be accurate. It's not like boilies. When you fish boilies, you, they're grazing, they're coming in, picking up. But wayward spods, you're going to be putting hundreds of seeds down potentially in silt and weed away from your spot yeah. and the fish could be preoccupied away from your hook baits for long periods of time. So the, the things with spotting is you've got to, got to clip up to get the distance the same every time and you're trying to concentrate the feeding over your hook baits yeah. to maximise the chance of you getting picked up. Okay, right, so let's just rewind that a little bit. You put a marker float out and found a spot you like. Yep. Then what have you done in terms of clipping up and marking up? Right, well, I find the spot with the marker float. I then clip a bare lead to the to the spot yeah. so that I know, I'm going to check it to see if it's definitely clear. Yeah. Once I've done that, I then walk that out on the grass behind me, the same distance as the spot, so they're exactly the same. Okay. And then hopefully as my lead goes down through the water, I'll land on the near edge of the patch and the bait will all land just, at, just on the back edge of the patch. And the reason for that is? So that my line's not going through the spot. So you're not alerting the fish and you're not getting liners and yeah, they can yeah. feed. Okay, lovely. Well, if you want to show us, we've got a spot out there, which is basically what, what we've used, guys, is an unhooking mat. The mat represents the little gravel area that Daryl's fishing. Believe me, it's a small, tight spot that he's fishing to, and the grass is the weed. So Daryl's going to show you how he goes about baiting it nice and accurately. I was noticing something you did there, Daryl, which would be worth pointing out to the viewers. You, 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 when you sense it's going to hit the clip, you're laying the rod out to one side. Yeah, if it's going left or right, I'll try and, I'll try and alter it to sort of rectify it if it's right. So if it's going to the left, I'll pull the rod to the right. If it's going to the right, I'll pull it to the left. Okay. Just trying to correct it a little bit if I can. But more than that, also, if it hits the clip really hard, you're yeah. letting it absorb it and you're letting yeah, the rod... Yeah, yeah, obviously that's the main priority. You don't, if you hit the clip hard with rage, you're going to snap it. You know, it's going to cut through. Remember that, guys. And it'll, you'll go past your spot as well, so... Watch that, Daryl lay this down just right. Beautiful, right, bang in the middle of the spot. Perfect. Another key thing with this, guys, accuracy again, as Daryl said, it's very, very important. Don't overfill your spot. Yeah, no, if, you, if you overfill it past the fins, and it doesn't fly through, you know, you want to fill it just to the bottom of the fins, nose heavy, it'll fly like an arrow. Perfect. Okay, shall we have a look at what you've done? Lovely. Okay, mate, well, Looks look at right, that. Doesn't it? So you've got, effectively, this is the sort of spot that you guys will be trying to find with your marker rods and with a, uh, a lead on its own. I say that because sometimes with a marker float, it's too much in thick weed, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it can all be, get a bit much. So flick around with a lead, find a spot, clip it up, then put a, a float on. Anyway, the point is, once you've found your spot, and typically they're this sort of size, you know, sort of four foot long, maybe two foot deep, this is what you're fishing on out there, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it probably might be a little bit bigger than what's out in the lake, but not a lot, it'd be very close to this. Okay, so this simulates probably, what, five spots worth of bait or something? Yeah, yeah, about five spots worth. Okay, so Daryl's put out effectively a bucket, caught a fish on it, uh, unfortunately, it came adrift, but it was a big carp, so it proves accurate casting, baiting nice and tight can work very, very well. On these kind of lakes, a lot of spodding goes on. So believe me, fishing tight and accurately like this, spodding very, very tidily, fishing better than the anglers around you on busy lakes will get you more bites. We're going to look now at my technique, which is the complete and utter opposite. 
Now make no mistake, spodding accurately like Darrell is doing is highly effective on, on most lakes, particularly on these type of busy circuit waters. Darrell's hooked the only fish so far, so that proves. But I'm fishing a totally different tactic which can also work equally well on this kind of water. And the reason I think it works so well is because it is so contrastingly different to the masses who are spodding. And believe me, places like Linear, probably 80% of the anglers who come here are spodding. So I'm using a throwing stick and I'm using fairly large 18 mil boilies. And what I'm doing is I'm spreading them around an area. So I'm not using a marker float. I'm not even clipping my lines up. I'm picking an area where th there's actually some weed because I don't want to be fishing on a tight little gravel spot where I can let the fish browse freely on little boilies like this or big boilies like this. So I'm going to put these out and I'll show you what they'll look like artificially out in the lake. And when you're baiting like this, you want to cover a nice wide area size of maybe three or four bivvies at its smallest and as big as a tennis court maybe at its largest. Now the thing you will find on most busy lakes these days is that the seagulls are very very zoned in to boilies and throwing sticks and it makes baiting up during the day quite difficult at times. The trick is simply wait until it gets dark, the gulls have gone off to roost and you can get your bait out there nice and accurately because they will take them with great proficiency. The other thing that's important to remember is if you're going for any kind of range, then your baits can split. And to alleviate that problem, simply dip the end of the throwing stick in the water and carry on putting the bait out. And what that does is reduces the velocity and the spin and it stops the brakes, baits from breaking up in flight. It will decrease your distance slightly, but at least they'll go out whole. Now, <laughs> interestingly enough, I'm putting these baits out over grass and there are already six or seven gulls swooping around for these free baits. It shows just how switched on to anglers baits these birds are. Look at that. Well I'm fishing over about three kilos of boilies out there. I put maybe a hundred or so baits out now. Let's put those out. <laughs> the gulls are still getting them and we'll take a look and we'll see what it might look like if it was laying on the bed of the lake. Okay now what we've got here guys is a spread of boilies over low-lying weed. As I said to you earlier fishing over Canadian pondweed, which I think is about two foot deep. And the thing with Canadian pondweed is when it's low lying like this, it tends to knit itself together, kind of kapunk style, and it means that the, any boilies coming down will rest on that thick cross hatch of weed. It means they're very, very vi visible to the fish that are passing through, and also creates a situation which is totally different to that tight baiting situation that Daryl's fishing. Now, when they come in on a clear, tight little spot like that, the fish, make no mistake, are under no illusion that they're being fished for, but they'll take the chance to come in and feed on an area like that. But they will feed carefully. This kind of situation is totally different. Now, what you can see, you imagine this is the weed. This is very similar to how it would look on the bottom. The boilies would just be sat on top of the fronds, on top of the cross hatch of Canadian pondweed, and you've got a foot, then two foot, six inches between each bait. Now, what happens is the fish come in, and he's just traveling along the bottom. It's not particularly just minding his own business maybe. He comes along, he sees a boily. Now a boily lying like that, safe in the weed, it's not a bright yellow one, it's not obvious. He's gonna, he's gonna probably eat that, represents no danger at all. Comes down, eats that boily, swims off. Enjoys the experience of eating one of those. Goes another couple of feet, there's another one. He's gonna drop down and eat that. Now at that point, you've got that carp in an angling situation where he's trapped and you can catch him, but he doesn't realise he's being fished for because he's not focused into an intense feeding situation. And that's why spread baiting with boilies works so well. There's two types of presentation you can use for this. One is a pop-up off the lead and the other is a chod rig. And I'll be showing both of you those next.